Following video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. A Total War Saga, Troy, is the kind of name that doesn't exactly evoke great expectations. The previous Saga game, Britannia, didn't review well, and the past decade of historical Total War games has been a back and forth cycle of critical hits following critical misses. Shogun 2? Great. Rome 2? Not so great. Attila? Great. A Total War Saga Britannia? Not so great. Three Kingdoms? Great. But I think the past few years of highly reviewed Warhammer games and then Three Kingdoms got my expectations quite a bit too high for this one. Those games saw fantasy merge with mythical history with super-powered individual hero characters whose personalities and allegiances carry heavy consequences, and I was expecting them to see them leverage those systems, the technology, and some of the creative fantasy from Warhammer to go into a Trojan War game. Seems like a no-brainer, but unfortunately the baseline experience here is more in line with, uh, Rome 2 from seven years ago. Don't get me wrong though, a Total War Sagatroid turned out alright. It's better than Rome 2 from seven years ago, not the best in the series, but totally fine as an introduction and as a return to it for a 20-year-long fan. Every time I begin one of these games, I feel dumb as hell. I, I've done it like six times, but at this point in history, I think we're gonna have to start chalking that up to bad tutorials and a user experience that's a decade behind the times. But I also want to chalk that up to a Total War Sagatroy feeling like one of the more difficult games in the franchise. If you haven't played one of these games before, then know that every single one of them splits the experience up into two genres real-time battles and turn-based grand campaigns. And the economic model of the campaigns is traditionally tyrannical. It is what it says on the tin. Total War traditionally makes victorious battles a more reliable source of revenue than taxes. But that logic gets flipped on its head for the relatively less metallic economies of the Bronze Age. You don't pay for things with money in this game. You barter. And the first and most common resource you'll be trading for is food. Soldiers cost food first and foremost, and then keep costing food every single turn after. Armies cost so much food that I was never really able to comfortably feed more than three or four of them at a time. Buildings cost wood and stone, and it's only the later tiers of the upgrade tree that buildings and units will start costing you bronze, and finally, rarest and least used of all, is gold. These resources can't be grown on farms or mines that can be plopped down anywhere on the map, but from pre-placed settlements that will have that resource, and only that resource, permanently buried in their land for the whole game. The turning points in your campaign, the decisions that balance your economy, will be winning control over fertile coastlands or hills of metal deposits. Buildings are also short-term investments more than long-term investments. You should regularly be tearing them down and putting other buildings in their place as your needs change. On top of that, this is trying to depict an era in warfare before reliable cavalry and siege engines. Walled cities are especially dangerous in the Bronze Age, and you're better off sitting outside spending a few turns letting the enemy city starve first before getting half your soldiers killed through those gates and walls. Which does make a lot of sense considering the source material is a nine year long siege. So, sieges and economic management are both harder here. It took a while to get used to, but it gradually started making a lot of sense. It's a clean way to tie the limits of your expansion to how much territory you've already conquered. And it guarantees that you'll have an interesting, problematic, parasitic relationship with the friendlier powers at your border. From Africa, boxes of ebony, ostrich eggs, all of Troy's traders pay tribute to King Menelaus. They bring the world to Sparta. There's no shame in restarting a Total War campaign that's going bad. Once I figured out how to balance the economy and then crunch the numbers behind all the unit stat sheets and even jotted down some notes on paper, things turned from a janky mess of numbers into a very, very interesting game of managing transactional friendships. Is this a joke? Are you sure you're not? This is why you're here. To destroy our economy. Unlike in the Iliad itself, the Danaeans can't immediately sail across the Aegean Sea and spend nine years camping outside strong walled Troy. Instead, you'll have to do a very complicated island hopping campaign, dividing, conquering, and allying with a salad of neutral powers placed between Greece and Troy while making sure the Trojans don't do the same. Because of these harsh new economic rules, neither side can really win this war without a powerful alliance. 
Hence why some of the Trojan brothers, like Paris and Hector, are treated as their own separate factions. If, as they do in the stories, your egotistical, overly dramatic Bronze Age brothers disagree and fight, it can turn smooth sailing into grinding attrition. And once they're on the battlefield, those Homeric characters turn into superhuman hero units. They're a stand-in for the general bodyguard units of previous games, except for being 50 horses of heavy cavalry moving as one, it's just the one guy. Keeping true to Bronze Age propaganda, you'll see King Agamemnon stop entire units, clog up choke points, distract, taunt, buff, or terrify enemies, and even kick down the entire enemy gates by himself. Get into a fight with another hero, and there's a neat little AI visual effect where the soldiers form a circle around them, and it looks like you're watching a little Assassin's Creed or Dynasty Warriors going on down there. Heroes are more theatrical and more versatile than general bodyguards. They can be upgraded into a number of specialized roles, including a heavy horse chariot if you do want a bit of that old flavor back. But the idea of having one super-powered, versatile commando with customizable abilities ultimately just means more tools for the player to play with. Battles flow back and forth a lot faster than previous games, too. You won't be winning battles with long, dramatic cavalry charges so much as delicate, micromanaged flanking maneuvers from fast, sneaky, fleet-footed infantry. Panicking, routing units recover their courage pretty darn fast, making for multiple waves of assault so you can't rest easy even if you manage to push the enemy back from your lines. Meanwhile, you're also juggling meter management for your hero's super duper ultimate rage mode because that's a thing, so you want to keep them taking and giving out hits, but you also don't want them too vulnerable. Are the stories about you true? They say you can't be killed. I wouldn't be bothering with the shield then, would I? On normal difficulty and above, heroes can be fragile, and if you actually manage to cut one down in battle, that is a heavy morale penalty and a cue to push forwards. To push fast and hard into maps whose choke points, high grounds, and flanking routes are always a stressful but manageable 30-second sprint from each other. There's just a lot of systems going on that keep these matches flowing in dramatic directions and give the player interesting, dramatic decisions to always be making. Heroes give you lots of tools to creatively pull off unlikely victories or unexpected comebacks, especially once both sides are whittled down to their final men. Things feel like they can go either way. The Total War battle system has never exactly been balanced for tight competition. They're kind of janky, sandboxy, simulator-esque games. But I think the battles here will satisfy people of both persuasions. Those in it for sandbox experimentation and for a compelling, satisfying, serious challenge. They took away multiplayer for this one. Naval battles too, I mean, no one liked them anyway. But I still feel like this actually might have been the most seriously I've had to crunch numbers and strats for a single-player Total War. This is the most hours I've spent replaying doomed campaign battles over and over again until pulling off the one little move that reverses it into a victory. So it took a while, but I have ended up leaning pretty positively on a Total War Saga Troy. It's fun and it's interesting. There are systems in place to make sure that you can indeed have Agamemnon and Odysseus fighting side by side while Achilles sits it out and mopes. You can indeed have Hector and Achilles duel it out one on one in front of walls of troops, and there's actual tokens at play to incentivize you to do all that and actually play out the Iliad the video game. The leaders have cute quest lines that follow the mythic dramas, and it's hard not to love the aesthetic of the game. Just look at how vast, unexplored, and mysterious the world looks when it's really just this tiny little chunk of Europe. Homer himself is your tutorial buddy, and a lot of flavor text is written in heroic verse, and I love that. So why did I begin the review with a bunch of trepidation about it feeling like a cheap spin-off? Because there are a lot of negatives to go with those positives. So, this is the first Total War I've played where it doesn't feel like it takes forever to calculate the AI turns, and that's good, but it still stops to take its sweet time to inform you of useless notifications and bad deals, and it buries a lot of your most routine clicks behind menus of sub-menus. Playing with the hero abilities during the battles is good, clean fun, but the repetition of ticking tiny upgrade icons for tiny passive bonuses to get there sure gets old in the long run. Gotta... gotta do this after every single victory. The readability of the UI is an issue, too. Too many icons look the same, or straight misleading based on the name. Shielded Spearmen and Regular Spearmen both have shields. Young Spearmen do not. There probably should be a more visible warning if a unit is losing their current combat. A subtle flash just doesn't cut it. Tutorial buddy Homer will give you a reminder right about the time when it's too late to save them. Your warriors have been routed. 
A lot of my issues, I think, get down to the core of how the game engine works. Without a more readable UI, I will lose track of what's going on in the bigger battles unless I'm playing in slow motion. And the audio engine can't slow down all the sound effects, it just cuts them all out, and that means I'm hearing 15 to 30 minutes of an awfully boring soundscape. But most of all, it's time for Total War to have a rewind button. Single player strategy is an environment where one learns through open-ended, player-driven experimentation. Learning these systems requires failure, and there's no consequence whatsoever for saves coming. At this point, for a complicated single-player strategy game like this, I'm more inclined to believe that save scumming is perfectly enjoyable, legitimate gameplay. Hell, in this one, it, it, it's like they knew. Loading and saving are faster than ever, and they put in some hidden mechanics accounting for it. Actions determined by dice rolls, like assassinations, are predetermined at the beginning of a turn, so if you are destined to fail a dice roll, then that actually incentivizes you to make a move that's literally less of a gamble. Especially for a higher difficulty total war like this, where one misclick from, say, a UI that doesn't make it perfectly obvious which tiny little ant of a unit you have selected can lose you the match. A couple Fire Emblems ago, they put in an undo button. You got limited uses per match, depending on difficulty, and I had a blast playing with that thing, seeing how different the same battles could play out, and seeing other games and other Total War games evolve past some of this one's problems are why a Total War Saga Troy feels fine on its own, but definitely a few sequels behind the times of its own franchise. A lot of trouble I was having with my first impressions might have been down to how underwhelming it feels to see this look and sound so much like Rome 2 from seven years ago. Music and voice acting in particular feel especially steeped in Rome 2. Total War has always been infamously janky, and the occasional typo glitches, the crazy late-game snowball balancing of it all, does give a kind of cheap and dirty vibe. Despite, you know, perfectly fine production values and me having enough of my fun with the gameplay. Hopefully I've explained why, but now that I've talked about that, let's talk about the implications! The Trojan War was something people thought was complete fiction up until the late 1800s, when archaeologists discovered that there was an ancient city located around where Homer said Troy was. And there was a layer of this city full of burnt ashes and bashed up skeletons. Troy may have existed, some kind of Trojan War may have happened, but according to an introduction written by Herbert J. Muller, the archaeological evidence doesn't discount the possibility that it was actually destroyed by a fire or an earthquake. If the Trojan War really did happen, it would have been on a far smaller scale and between more culturally distinct people, worshipping different gods than the Olympian Greek gods who were intervening on both sides in the Iliad. Why am I bringing this up? Because a Total War Saga Troy makes an attempt at being more plausible than what we see in the Iliad. A pretty awkward one if you know those details, but a very, very interesting one either way. There's almost a kind of narrative progression to it, a story of you uncovering the mysticism of a mythological setting to gradually develop a more grounded, realistic worldview instead, as your resources and territory and essentially your knowledge of the rest of the world develop. That beautiful terracotta skybox of an unknown world gradually turns into a, an incredibly familiar chunk of Europe. Centaurs, minotaurs, cyclopses, and harpies are in the game, but as anatomically correct human beings who are wearing a scary costume have some special abilities and use that mythos to intimidate enemies on the battlefield. A cyclops is just some big hairy man wearing a mammoth skull who throws big rocks at the enemy. He's kinda, he's kinda your artillery unit. Centaurs aren't half men, half horses, but rather early horseback cavalry showing up in an era where most horses hadn't been domesticated to be big and strong enough yet for riding. Until you unlock those, you will be using chariots. The implication, then, is that the legend of the centaur itself comes from a completely mundane origin, either from the imaginative minds of drunken, terrified, uneducated, illiterate soldiers only catching blurry glimpses of these horsemen through the ranks, or from exaggerated war stories they were telling the folks back home afterwards. This is interesting. This got me googling down Wikipedia holes and reading books that I would not have otherwise. This introduced me to something called the bicameral mind hypothesis, a psychologist's idea that during the Bronze Age, people didn't know that they could be fully in control of their own thoughts. 
A novel called The Rage of Achilles explores, with modern and borderline pornographic language and heavy research into the mythology, what a more realistic version of the Trojan War would have looked like if everyone was operating under the bicameral mind hypothesis. The novel depicts a Bronze Age world with a kind of normalized mass schizophrenia, a genuine belief among all the social classes in this mythology full of stories of people getting briefly possessed by invisible gods who appear only to them even though they're not allowed to look at them. Multiple generations of people would have grown up being taught never to question their intrusive thoughts or control their moments of passion and emotional outbursts. For the ruling class, this means that might makes right through the inductive logic of everyone being unable to tell the difference between lies and truth. And without developed systems of writing, record keeping, nor any kind of scientific skepticism, the truth is genuinely beyond the capabilities of their perception. The story about the war all being over a woman and heroes fighting one-on-one -on -one combat is purely propaganda, and the legend of Achilles is only remembered through the ages because the real guy it was based on was a ravenously out of control sociopathic maniac barely even able to communicate. There's a similar kind of dissonance shared by a reader of this book and a player of this game. Some characters have moments of clarity, like Odysseus, because, you know, he's the smart one. Odysseus, back in the big half-circle of little kings, can barely believe what he sees. Grown men, lords of thousands, men who made their first kills before their beards sprouted, weep and embrace. Odysseus backs away from Eurypylos as he staggers forward, sobbing, snot soaking his beard, but cannot avoid his bear hug. Athena speaks through you again, Odysseus, he whispers in his ear. I saw her standing just above your shoulder when you spoke. Odysseus hugs back, though it makes him queasy. Oh, he says. Odysseus is fascinated. They are like children. When he thinks of children, he thinks of his own Telemachus and hopes he is not this stupid. It can be argued that nowadays we are living in a post-truth era, and I think a few thoughts on that are what inspired the team to think of Bronze Age Greece as being in a pre-truth era. Just listen to some of the things your envoys say. The truth is not fixed. They will not know what to believe. Before more systems of writing developed, envoys and diplomats had to memorize orders from the kings. Huh. When you read the news, it's presented as abstract drawings on clay pottery. Flavor text rarely breaks this kayfabe. Tutorial messages and alert pop-ups talk about the gods favoring you because birds were flying in a certain direction. Then there's the divine will system. Pray or make sacrifices to the gods and you get some short-term bonuses. A buff to morale or economic output or something. Not something dramatic enough to look like magic, but definitely some kind of real material benefit that comes from diligent participation in the societal rituals. And despite all the hours I put into it, I don't think I ever noticed that praying to Poseidon or Apollo actually prevented all those earthquakes, storms, and fires that keep happening. The flavor text says it should, but in practice via the mechanics, it really just makes people riot less whenever the weather does inevitably get bad. You, the player, are essentially seeing with your eyes the stuff on the screen a different reality than what these characters are living through. It's a kind of dramatic irony. Like I said, that is really, really interesting. The game rides the line between a realistic and a mythological explanation of its own mechanics, depending on how much the player wants to immerse their own mind in the supernatural logic versus breaking immersion to try and min-max their way through the game logic. I don't want to call it ludonarrative dissonance, I don't want to call it cognitive dissonance, but there is a kind of dissonance going on here that is super interesting to think about. This gradual reveal of harder history than what the flavor text suggests is not done sloppily. There's subtlety and artistry to it. Blink and you'll miss it, it's almost subliminal, but the very first shot of the intro FMV takes place in a modern day museum. The problem with this, and my god, it's, it's a nitpicky weird problem, is whatever vision you had in mind for how the Trojan War looked or how Bronze Age combat in general would have looked is probably not going to be explored here. It's not fully accurate to the real-life archaeology, nor is it fully accurate to the mythology either. It rides a line between the two, but somehow I feel like the game would have been more interesting if it fully committed to either side. It could have happened, and it might have been easier than you thought. The Iliad itself is creepily video gamey. Of course, there's a relative cheapness to human life, but also this ritual of stripping slain enemies of their armor. 
After almost anyone makes a kill, Homer then says, and then he stripped them of the bronze armor, just like picking up their ammo in an FPS game. Homer also describes big battles as being the escalations of smaller skirmishes where soldiers are trying to recover their comrades' bodies. It's like a connect-the-dots game of small-scale objective capture that escalates into something bigger. These are activities ready for gamification, as is the musical aspect to it. Something people don't talk about as much for some reason, and something I do wish the text of the game was written in more often, is how it's meant to be heard as poetry. The poetry of the Iliad speeds up and slows down with the flow of battle lines, and it was also a way to help them memorize these 24-hour long poems without writing them down. Despite however many games you've played with the word Odyssey in them, there are still some new creative ways left to make video game versions of the Homeric epics. I'm also still waiting for someone to make a rock opera movie out of the Iliad, but Total War doing the Iliad kind of does have to stick to a familiar and limited vision. It's entirely appropriate, it does the job as a good fun adaptation with some interesting implications to think about, but if it is going for realism after all, then the scale of the battles and the cultures that we're looking at are so off that you're still going to have to suspend your disbelief anyway. This is a surprisingly faithful adaptation of the foundational work of Western literature, something that absolutely changed the way people thought for centuries, so I have to wonder if, if the game would have made a better impression on launch, if it would have been seen as more polished and complete, if they ended up going with a tone that was a little more artsy and, and fully committing either to the mythology or the archaeology versus the kind of ethereal, goofier version that rides both lines here. As faithful of an adaptation as it is, it definitely feels like there's a layer of polish missing when there's no blood and gore in a video game version of the Iliad. And on my way out of here, I'm gonna recommend some companion viewing because I can get you a year of Curiosity Stream for 26% off. Curiosity Stream is a source of thousands of legit documentaries from legit educational institutions, now including historian Betty Hughes's Genius of the Ancient World series, where a biographical episode on Socrates is able to get into the specifics of how and why people's thinking really did change on our way out of this age of mythological history. That subscription will also include access to Nebula, a streaming service of exclusive content from educational YouTubers looking to upload videos too long or too non-monetizable here. So if you sign up for curiositystream.com slash superbunnyhop, you'll not only get access to the bigger budgeted educational TV programming out there, but you'll also be supporting a huge community of serious educational YouTubers as well. And those promos stack together. Once again, that's curiositystream.com slash superbunnyhop for 26% off. Thanks for sponsoring, thanks for watching, and try to keep it all together.